if you'd like to turn to John chapter 14, we'll particularly look at verse 6, but it's good to see a verse in context, isn't it? This is almost the last of the I am's that we'll be looking at, the I am's that have uh, a metaphor that goes with it. You've seen the list before of the I am's, and we're almost through, and there's just last, the last one, I am the true vine, which God willing we'll be dealing with next week. Remember that Jesus was coming to the end of his ministry, as far as the public were concerned, he was no longer going to speak to the public. He said what he had to say, he'd shown the wonderful miracles, and largely they'd rejected him, particularly the Jewish aristocracy and leadership and the priests. He's with his disciples, and from John chapter 13 through to 16 and possibly 17 as well, if you'd like to add that to it, it's a personal presentation by the Lord Jesus. He washes the disciples' feet. He tells them things, intimate things, that will prepare them for what's going to come after his death. And their ministry, of course, many of them would face death as martyrs for the sake of the gospel. The disciples were a bit perplexed because, as you know, the Jews at that time, they thought that the Messiah would come and the Messiah would have the big role of kicking the Romans out, restoring all the blessings that the Jews had and bringing back the money and all the rest of it and the land. And they would have a wonderful time when the Messiah came here on earth. They didn't realise that my kingdom, said Jesus, is not of this world. Uh, it was another kingdom he was talking about, the kingdom of heaven. Although he has a wonderful plan for the Jews, because they're his people, and they're still his people, and there's lots of prophecies that we could go into about that, it's wonderful to know that he has a plan. And even though possibly we don't understand it some of the time, when we get to the end of our lives, we'll be able to see the way the Lord has been leading us. The disciples were perplexed because here is Jesus coming, it would seem, as the Messiah, and then he says, I'm leaving. Like, what? They were really shocked. They'd given up everything. They said to him on one occasion, we've given up anything, everything to follow you. That's what it meant to be a follower, a disciple in those days. Jesus called them and they followed. They left everything. Matthew left the money that he was collecting for the Romans, the taxes, left everything and followed the Lord Jesus. And they'd all done that. And then Jesus told them that within their group there was a betrayer. It didn't mark him particularly that they understood, but Judas obviously was the man who was the betrayer in the group. Peter was the one that was big, strapping leader, and everybody thought, oh, he'll be fine. But Jesus said, no, Peter's going to be a denier. He's going to deny me three times. So everything in the world that they thought they knew had been shattered. And of course, he said of the disciples, all of them were going to run away and they always kind of scatter and, and go their own way, which they did initially before they reformed again and the Holy Spirit came and they were able to stand up on the day of Pentecost and preach the gospel with the wonderful result of 3,000 people being converted and baptised. So we've got a, a natural sermon, a sermon tonight from our reading, I am the way, the truth and the life. And all good preachers should have three points. <laughs> so you can't get around that one. That's Three points. I am the way. There used to be a, a vogue ooh, 20 or 30 years ago now where people had stickers with a, a finger pointing up one way. There was a group called One Way Jesus and uh, when Dave Pope was singing and others, uh, one way was the, the direction that people were suggesting that people go into because that is exactly what the gospel is. Jesus is the way and he's the only way 
to follow. I don't know about you, but uh, knowing the way to your destination takes an awful lot of the stress out of the journey, doesn't it? I don't have a, a sat-nav. I've tried one or two and usually ended up <laughs> in a completely wrong place because I'd followed slavishly these sat-navs. But I think they're, they're getting better these days and they're built in the cars, and the modern cars anyway. Uh, and it's good to know that somebody in the front, when uh, Suzanne and Wes Ross came last time uh, from America, they had this uh, hired car, I think it was a, a Volvo, and they were talking about the lady th who was in talking to them, and they gave Fiona because she sounded very posh. And, uh, the posh English accent telling them where to go. And it was helpful to them to know the way. Now, in our reading, you see that the disciples weren't too sure even then about the way, who the way was, and the fact that Jesus Christ was God. They still hadn't got it. So if you're a bit slow on your theology, don't worry. <laughs> there are other people that have trouble as well thinking these things through. So the way is what the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to follow. I expect you've heard the old joke uh, about, it might be in uh, the book that's been, been passed around from Rosemary, I think. Uh, man in the countryside stops to ask direction. He's from the town and he picks up uh, a local and the local yokel uh, is asked for directions. And the yoku said, well, for a start, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> That's a fat lot of good, isn't it? Uh, it may, may be a fair comment not to start from here. But we've got to start from where we are. And when the Lord Jesus meets us by his Holy Spirit, he meets us where we are. That's why our conversion is unique to us. It involves the same sort of grace from God and the forgiveness of sins and the recognition that the Lord Jesus is our saviour. But each one of us come in a different way. I remember Victor, uh, Victor Newman used to say that he was brought to Christ at Wellington Chapel many, many years ago because the man was preaching about the second coming of Christ. And he was, the thought of being left behind when Christ came was enough to cause him to want to be saved. Others, uh, are, the Holy Spirit deals with us in different ways. But eventually we all have to understand the grace of God and say, ask for that salvation. And when we ask, we receive from the Lord Jesus. So the disciples didn't like where they were at that particular time. And they were pretty terrified of what's going to happen in the future, especially when Jesus was arrested. No wonder they fell apart at the seams and, and ran away. People of the way was an expression used of Christians. Uh, I don't know whether you've uh, noticed in the book of Acts that I think six times Christians are called the people of the way. You may remember when Roger Childers and I used to do the Three Counties show together, we had a tent and it was called The Way. Now that was a, a sort of subtle way of drawing people. Uh, if you had I am the way, the truth and the life on the outside these days, I expect people would back off immediately. But this was legitimate because that was what Christians were called, people of the way. And of course Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. The name Christian was a pejorative slur that was, well, it first happened in Antioch, didn't it? If you read through the book of Acts in chapter 11, they were first called Christians in Antioch. And it was a, it was a nickname that they would throw at Christians because they, they despised them. But the people of the way, I think, is rather a, a lovely term. That's why often we talk about Jesus followers, people who are following the way, the Lord Jesus as our saviour. 
when Paul was arrested, you remember, in the book of Acts, he stood on the steps of the barracks and was allowed to speak by the officer. And he said, I persecuted the followers of this way. There was the expression. To their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. He was upset by that as he looked back in later years because he would say, I'm the chief of sinners. Because I, I, I killed Christians earlier on. I put them in prison. I was totally anti-God until that road to Damascus conversion that he experienced later on. When Paul was in Rome, he was before the governor Felix, he said this, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. God's way had been revealed to the Jews, but largely they had not accepted it, had they? And frequently gone a completely different way. Isaiah 53, verse 6, we often quote when we're preaching the gospel, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We all want our own way. We don't have to be children all our lives to want our own way. But as we get older, we still want our own way. We may try to get it in more sophisticated ways than screaming and having tantrums as children might do, but we want our own way. And coming to Christ is surrendering to him. We sing that hymn, don't we? I surrender all. But I think we have tongue in cheek when we sing that, really, because it, it's a... It's a very deep commitment we're making to the Lord Jesus that we surrender, surrender all to you. We want you to lead in every single aspect of our lives. The way had been revealed to Moses and the people of God. The law had been given, but they decided to go their own way. Modern culture says there are many different ways to God. If you do comparative religion at a university or a college, or even at schools, they're being told that to say Jesus is the way, the only way, is not right. But that's exactly what Jesus said. I think personally that we're heading towards a time when persecution is going to be very much more prevalent than it is today. People think it's an outrageous statement that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The old Billy Graham crusades always used to have that behind the, the, the platform. It's getting increasingly difficult now to, to put that up because it rankles people, it gets under their skin. They can't stand it because they believe that they know better. There's a, there are plenty of ways to get to heaven been called narrow-minded, been called bigoted, even snobbish. You think, oh, you know the way, do you? And we don't. And if we can know the Lord Jesus as our Saviour, then we have come to know the way, the truth, and the life. I was talking to a man from another faith. He, he was a teacher, actually, of comparative religions. And he said to me, well, all spiritual paths lead up this mountain and we all get to the top. Have you heard that one? It doesn't matter which path you use to get to the top of the mountain, uh, we're all going to get there in the end. Well, logic tells you that all religions can't be right. One can be right, or the lot could be all wrong, if you think of it logically. And he explained it like this. He got his hand out. He said, well, it's, it's like this, he said. There are different pathways. I always remember him doing it. He used his hand, he used his body, and it sort of stuck in my mind. It oh, doesn't matter which pathway you choose, you always end up with God. Well, I don't think his idea of God was the same as the biblical God anyway, but Jesus said quite clearly, 
that he was the way, the truth, and the life. I've told you that I've been reading through Jeremiah in my quiet times. I'm, I'm nearly through, <laughs> I'm very pleased to say. There's good bits and bad bits and depressing bits. But this is one of the sort of more depressing bits if you make the wrong decision. Jeremiah 21, verse 8. This is what the Lord says. See, I'm setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine and plague. And whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you, you will live. So here's Jerusalem surrounded and Jeremiah was saying, look, your only hope is to surrender. But they wouldn't. Oh no, we're going to go on fighting. And eventually they decided they'd go down to Egypt, which again, he said, don't go down to Egypt. They went down there and suffer the consequences. We love to do it our way. For many years, Frank Sinatra's song, My Way, was the number one song played at funerals. I expect you've heard it um, frequently. I think it's been knocked off the top spot now by, by other things. But we're now in a stage where funerals have become less religious and more secular. In fact, I went to a secular funeral over at uh, the crematorium in the forest and it, it, was, it was a weird thing. <laughs> uh, nobody knew when to stand or to sit. <laughs> there were no hymns and the husband of the person that had died had recorded 30 years before uh, some piano music which was played and, and, and it was very, very strange. And at the end, nobody knew how to sort of finish it up. I suppose they've, they've got to the point now where there are, there are secular celebrants, people that would say that they are uh, geared up to do it if that's the way you want to go. And it would seem that lots of people are going in that direction. You've only got to listen uh, to the television for a couple of days, probably only one, <laughs> and you'll see the advert for pure cremation or something similar. Uh, the advert says they do the practical bit, but there's no service and they return the ashes. In other words, they're gone and that's it. No reverence, no awareness of them going to be with God. Uh, and that seems to be the way everything is going these days. In Proverbs 14, verse 12, it says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. I think we were in that sort of situation in many respects when you look at the political situation and the war in, in Europe. And there's a way that man thinks he's right and yet it's the way to death and it's a classic case of the thousands already that have been killed in that war alone and Yemen and many other places around the world where people are doing what they think they want and consequently suffering is the outcome of it. Jesus, you remember, described a narrow way and a broad way. He said it's easy to go on the broad way and there's lots and lots of people these days that go along with the flow. Experts get on the telly, we've seen it actually, if you uh, go back over perhaps the, the um, advice that we had over COVID, <laughs> for instance. All these experts get together and you daren't say, oh, they're wrong. And then they change their mind and then the politician stands up and says this. And in the end we look back and we think, who was right? I haven't got a clue. Uh, there is a way which seems right. It's the broad way and the majority are going that way. And if you live your life as a non-follower of the Lord Jesus, you're far more acceptable to the world around you. You can swear and nobody will say anything. You can lie and cheat and, and uh, perhaps have affairs or whatever you're going to do. Uh, in the sexual realm, you can do whatever you like. You can say, oh, is that for cash to get rid, rid of the, the, the VAT? And people are like, no, oh, it's perfectly all right, because it's their way. Yet if you go God's way, then things 
are very much uh, more difficult to follow. The narrow way is the way that we are to follow. It's sort of like a, a knife edge that we walk on, isn't it? If you try to follow the Lord, it's, it's so difficult to, to keep straight on that way. So that's the, the way. And the truth. What on earth is the truth? Well, last week, if you watched the television at all, you would have seen the Commons Committee of Privilege and one Boris Johnson. And they were seeking to find the truth, they say. And Boris was given, interestingly enough, a Bible to hold while he swore his oath. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. You don't hear it very often now because people can swear on whatever holy book they like. As long as it's recognised as a holy book, they'll, they'll, they can swear on that or they can not uh, swear by God if they don't believe in, in God and so on. But that was the Bible and the name of God incurred in this committee. Interesting that in John chapter 18, a little bit further on from our chapter, Jesus says, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. He's talking to Pontius Pilate, the Roman procurator, governor. And Pilate, I don't know whether it's sarcastically or what, you have to decide for yourself. He says, what is truth? Well, it's a big question, but it's the most important question in life to find out what the truth is. If you don't know the truth, you don't know anything. And so many things that we think we know, we don't actually know. Uh, you maybe have seen the, the program QI, uh, where they serve up facts about this, that, and the other. And I remember when Stephen Fry was uh, hosting it, he said, we've looked back over the last 10 years on the, the facts that we told you that were absolutely true, and half of them were wrong. <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> what is truth? Well, poor old Pilate, of course, and the, the readers of John's Gospel would understand the irony as they read it later on. He posed the wrong question. Not what is truth, but who is truth? Jesus stands before him, the Logos, that we've read in chapter 1 of John's cross when in the beginning was the word and the truth is right in front of him face to face he stands before the God of the universe and he doesn't understand sadly he was very he was a very cruel man he was eventually uh, sent back to Rome and I think he committed suicide back there so had a pretty bad end but his wife seemed to understand didn't she so I've suffered a lot about Jesus uh, in a dream. Have nothing to do with this guy, let him go. Uh, but no, he wanted his way. And he got his way. And he's now in eternity with the consequences of his way. The lovely verse in Proverbs, I don't know whether you read Proverbs from time to time, but if you've got nowhere to go sometime uh, in your Bible reading, Proverbs has got 31 <coughs> chapters. So you can decide when in the month you start reading Proverbs and start on the 24th, 26th, whatever, uh, and, and pass on right the way through. There's always enough to get right the way through to the chap <coughs> uh, to uh, chapter 31. Excuse me. Proverbs says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, 
but fools despise wisdom and instruction. In other words, people who ignore God and don't reverentially fear God have no knowledge whatsoever, even though they think they've got masses of it. And you can see them strutting around the experts in all sorts of fields, saying that they're the ones that know the truth. <coughs> Way back in the early part of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell was frequently on um, radio programs, a great mathematician and philosopher, very revered person. And he delivered a, a lecture in 1927 in Battersea Town Hall. It was in aid of the National Secular Society. So the secularization of the country had well and truly been started by then. And the title of his lecture was Why I Am Not a Christian. Why I Am Not a Christian. <coughs> He concluded that he cannot be a Christian as he didn't think that Christ was the greatest or wisest of all men, let alone God incarnate. He, didn't, he thought there were other people wiser and more moral than Jesus. I don't know what world he's been living on, but <laughs> that's what he said. And to remove any doubt during this lecture, he explained that he found Buddha and Socrates to be wiser and more moral than Jesus. Now here's a clever man saying I'm a fool in God's eyes, declaring that he doesn't fear God and he reckons that other people far less of uh, personalities than the Lord Jesus Christ. No one compares to the Lord Jesus. He's in a, a division on his own. There's no other people that you can compare the Lord Jesus with. It's interesting that the term Buddha, which we've heard, if we've done uh, anything on religion at school, it means the enlightened one, a knower, so, someone who knows things, someone who's got the truth, someone who understands things. Well, clever people stand up and they reckon they do understand. <coughs> we frequently get Richard Dawkins on the TV, don't we? And Richard and others consider himself to be a bright. Their website will tell you a little bit about them and why they believe that they're a completely secular outfit. God has no involvement in what they believe at all. And they call themselves Brights. You can look it up yourself. Uh, just bright.com and you'll get uh, this page and you can go on from there. So the rest of us, presumably, we're not Brights, we're the dims. <laughs> I'd sooner be dim and no God <laughs> than to be bright and say there is no God and that I know better or find people uh, like Socrates and Buddha, who are infinitely better than Jesus Christ. Incredible, isn't it? <clears throat> In fact, on another occasion, Bertrand Russell said that Jesus wasn't a very good prophet because his disciples believed that Christ was coming back in his lifetime and he didn't, and he didn't come back, so he wasn't a very good prophet. He didn't understand very much about the Bible, did he? He didn't understand prophecy at all. Prophecy can stretch, for a, it can have an initial fulfilment, a secondary one, uh, and others, and then a final one. And of course Jesus is talking about the end times and we're, we've been living in the end times since the day of Pentecost. So at any time, Jesus Christ can return. We don't know when. Yes, the disciples thought in their day, in fact, those that had died, you remember, Paul had to, re, uh, to write to them to say, look, don't panic. You're not going to be left behind. Those that have gone before will come 
first when Jesus Christ comes back. Stephen Hawking is another chap who's considered to be very bright, at least he was during his lifetime. He was just a little bit older than me, which was quite uh, sobering for me to think about, but he was born in 1942 as well. And he would be considered by many, and rightfully so, as one of the greatest scientists since Einstein. And he's buried in Westminster, uh, Westminster Abbey between Charles Darwin and Newton. And his remains are called residual stardust because he believed that we're all basically stardust. And we'll all eventually end up back where we started. No explanation of where the stardust came from or the material came from. Just, well, he said on one occasion, I think the universe was spontaneously created out of nothing. Now, here's a wise man telling us <laughs> about the beginning. And, and he adds, spontaneously created out of nothing according to the laws of science. There's no law of science that says the world was spontaneously created or came into being. In fact, spontaneous generation, things like flies or, bats or whatever, uh, anything coming into uh, life out of nothing has been completely dis disproved by Louis Pasteur. And those of you who know anything about pasteurization will remember him. And that was 1859. And yet these guys are still coming up with this ridiculous uh, talk that they, they seem to know. And of course, in 1859, Charles Darwin uh, published his On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection and the other bit that we don't often read, or the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. It sounds a little bit racist to me, but, and it's caused a lot of trouble down through the years. But it was that period of time where we got rid of the truth, the Bible. We got rid of God himself. We didn't want to know. And it's so sad to, to realise that we're in this situation today where people have no hope because... Their hope has been taken away from them and placed in science that varies and changes like the wind. And lastly, life. The account of Lazarus, you remember, uh, we were looking at the other week. He died in Bethany and he'd been buried for four days. He was definitely dead. And the Jews, as you know at that time, thought that the spirit of that person hovered over the body for three days. And after, after that, the spirit had gone. And they were truly dead. So Jesus waited for that period of time so that nobody could say, ah, it said resuscitation. No, it was a resurrection. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he said to Lazarus, come out. And he came out and resumed his life. <coughs> life was gone from Lazarus. He could do nothing, but Jesus called him back and gave him life again. We've all been given the gift of life, and we are to use it wisely in following the Lord Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 10 was a famous uh, verse that a friend of mine, an evangelist, would always started his uh, missions with John 10, verse 10. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, or have it to the full. He, he thought that was a really good short sermon to start his mission, and then he would go on to other things. But he would always start with that because it was the most important thing for him to share with the people, that there was abundant life to be had in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> life, eternal life, and it's all by grace. 
Heaven is our destination. We often forget that. We moan about what's going on down here and the stresses and strains. Uh, if only we look up a little bit more, our destination is heaven. And it's called a country sometimes because of its vastness. It's called a city because of its inhabitants. It's called a kingdom because of the rule and order it has. It's called paradise sometimes because of its beauty. And in this lovely chapter, it's called a house because it's to do with the father's family. Great thing about heaven, you won't need a sat nav to find out where your room is. <laughs> because there's one house. Not lots of them all over the place. You've got to go. We're all in the same house. We're in the Father's house. Remember Abraham when they had relatives married, sons, daughters? They just put a little bit extra on the tent. And when he got older, uh, when they were in permanent buildings, they just add a little bit. And you see it still in the world today, in some parts of the world, where the extended family stays together. Unlike the way we operate, we will go all over the place. Whereas in my father's house are many rooms. You have one if you've trusted him. And you won't have any difficulty in finding it. You won't need a map or a sat nav because it's in the father's house. And you'll know the one that is allocated from, for you. But to reach our heavenly destination, we must surrender as we mentioned earlier, to the Lord's way. Let's pray.